Ackerman. Um, some of you might be like me and not realize that Tracy Hall, the inventor of synthetic diamonds, was a U of U graduate student. In fact, he was Henry Iron's first PhD student. And uh, he grew up in uh, Weber County and had always dreamed of going to work for General Electric. And he uh, ended up taking that dream job of his and joining a group that was doing work trying to find ways to make synthetic diamonds. So a physical chemist ended up not only having the chemistry, but the ability to make a press that was very inexpensive and made the very first synthetic diamonds as far as being used as a production process. And that eventually led to Mega Diamond. And uh, we are grateful that Dan Belknap, who grew up in Provo, had the common sense to come to the U. And, uh, and he ended up finding Dinesh Shetty, who's here in material science. And they were working on ways to look at fracture toughness of diamond. And he became uh, Dr. Shetty's PhD student. And uh, Dr. Shetty just told me that one of the things that he really loved about Dan Belknap is not only was he a great experimentalist, but he was a theorist and could combine the two. And that is a really great combination to put together. Um, Dan has spent his whole career at uh, Mega Diamond, which has been owned by Smith and Schlumberger and and uh, they've acquired companies, and he's just been putting out patents and doing really cool stuff. And what he's going to talk about today is, is really fun. He's collaborating with uh, physicists and chemists on campus. And uh, part of the talk you're going to hear is going to be presented when he's an invited speaker in Sydney in May. So you're getting a little bit of preview of what's happening. He's not going to tell the whole story because uh, this is going to be filmed. But uh, we are so glad to have Dan Belknap. He also told me today that I taught his son uh, two years ago. I never put that connection between Jonathan Belknap and Dan Belknap. And that just shows you there's uh, some loose connections up here. But uh, so delighted to have him. And, and uh, there are a lot of really great things that can happen He's going to talk about nanodiamonds and nitrogen vacancy uh, groups and some of the cool things that's, that are coming. And uh, let's welcome Dr. Dan Belknap. Okay, thank you. Uh, appreciate uh, you all coming to this presentation today. Um, like uh, um, Dr. Cutler mentioned, um, have a great connection um, with the uh, University of Utah. Many, many great memories here. Uh, really appreciate also uh, uh, my fantastic uh, graduate advisor being able to be here, Dr. Dinesh Shetty. Um, so yeah, is, is um, we go through the presentation today. Um, so a few things I want to talk about. First, um, generalized centering. Um, um, then how that relates to diamond. How uh, basically the, um, Utah became the genesis for a uh, multi-billion-dollar material. Um, not necessarily well known, um, but. Um, then talk a, a little bit more specifically and technically about diamond sintering in general. Um, and we'll have a little, little uh, uh, interlude talking about spectroscopy and, and what we do with, with um, in characterizing diamond materials and how that led to the, the work that we're currently doing now with uh, fluorescent nanodiamond. So hopefully it all uh, comes together and, and uh, makes some sort of sense in the end. Um, 
So um, I know it's not just a, 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 a material science audience, so just, just wanted to talk a little bit about some generalized uh, sintering. Um, so when we're talking about sintering, we're really talking about the uh, densification and uh, cohesion of a group of particles. Um, you know, this is occurring um, for, through the mechanisms of uh, reduction in surface energy, uh, largely. And this, this occurs by basically atomic motion, um, rearrangement, and you know, as if we're talking about atomic motion, rearrangement, we're always talking about some type of thermally activated process. Um, so as we're looking at materials and materials that center, um, you're generally, uh, a general rule of thumb is that uh, material was not going to self-center unless it reaches about half of its absolute melting temperature. At that point, then you have uh, enough um, you know, self-diffusion, enough atomic uh, mobility that, that you can start to, to uh, achieve this densification uh, reduction in surface area. Um, so one of the most common examples that I like to use in talking about sintering is, is just the, the, what happens in the world around us. So snow uh, being compacted and then turning into ice. Um, you know, from a, a volumetric perspective and what happens on this planet, I don't think there's anything that, that compares with, with, with this in a practical experience. Um, sintering is possible, so taking, taking this rule and saying what is half the absolute melting temperature, you know, I would say it's safe to say we've never experienced a, a temperature that's cold enough that sintering isn't possible with, with um, the, the ice system. Um, and, and particularly as, as we're quite close to the melting temperature, um, you know, right around, you know, zero degrees centigrade, that's, that's when things become the most thermally active. And, you know, so this, this is just showing a, a microstructure of what, what people have put together looking at the, um, basically uh, small particles, uh, snow particles, as they begin to densify. Um, eliminating the, the pore space in between them and eventually turning into something like glacial, glacial ice, which is probably the biggest, um, uh, the most interesting application. So if we talk about generalized sintering um, and, and the overall process. Um, so you're t initially talking about something that is a free-flowing powder. Then you're, you're applying some type of, uh, of a densification um, that is reducing the porosity, putting contact in between the particles. Um, then you get to uh, you know, intermediate stages where, and, and then a final stage where essentially you're, you're above, say, 99% porosity. Um, um, again, so the, the mechanism here is just the reduction in surface energy, the, the free energy minimization, um, you know, based, based on those, largely on those surface states. And, and if you look at a wide variety of materials, sintering has become actually quite, quite common. Um, you know, even materials like polymers that are trying to preserve the, maybe a, a coating structure. Um, but with the powder metallurgy, stainless steels, or, or other types of metals, or very, uh, the, the use of sintering is becoming quite common. Um, then uh, ceramics, this has always been the preferred method of, of consolidation. Um, and then mentioned glacial ice. Um, so yeah, and, and, and you can see this, this process practically. Um, many you, maybe you might have observed like driving across a driveway and compacting a bunch of snow. And then you know, you, you, you know that, 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 that maybe the temperature hasn't got extremely high, but maybe you come home uh, you know, later in the day and you see that that, that has, has begun is, is, is quite dense. It's turning into ice without any type of melting mechanism at all. This, this can happen to ice cubes in your freezer or something like this. Um, so, and, and then there's, there's different types of sintering that, that are used. Um, so solid state, um, liquid phase, pressure assisted, microwave, um, spark plasma are all, all different, different mechanisms. We'll talk today about um, uh, liquid phase and pressure assisted as, as a combination. Um, so many different types of materials center. And one of the most interesting materials that center is diamond itself in nature. 
So um, there, are, there are different types of, of center diamond. Um, I'll talk about this uh, carbonado. Basically, it's a, a naturally occurring um, centered diamond. This is, you can, you can see uh, what the microstructure of this, this looks like. It's a very nice microstructure taken uh, by some researchers uh, published about 14 years ago. Um, but in, in practice, this is what the, the scale of this material um, looks like. So these nodules that are basically centered diamond. Um, and depending on where, where, whether it's in a kimberlite pipe or not, uh, the, we'll call it different names. Um, but kind of the main takeaway is this is very problematic if you're trying to drill a hole in the earth. Imagine uh, encountering something that is a large chunk of, of essentially of solid diamond. You know, very destructive to what, whatever type of material that you're using to try to, to, make, a hole, uh, to make a hole in the ground. Um, so this is one of these interesting uh, situations where something that is essentially a nu nuisance and um, is looked at in a different way and, and somebody with a creative mind says, hey, if this is this much of a nuisance in drilling, what could we do with this material? Uh, so it was proposed in uh, 1958 as an engineering material. Um, good example of something going from uh, a nuisance to providing some motivation towards something that is uh, an eventual solution to some type of a problem. Um, so all of this involves uh, polycrystal and diamond. Um, so as uh, you might have guessed from uh, the abstract or, or uh, Dr. Cutler's introduction, I'm talking here about uh, Tracy Hall. So yes, uh, um, the strong connection here, to, uh, again, to the University of Utah. Um, graduated in 1948 um, with the, what we would say today, the Iring Group. Yes, first graduate student. After um, Dr. Iring came here from, from Princeton, basically with the, the task of starting up a, a, a world-class graduate school. And you know, those employed, I think, by the, by the university have some debt to, to um, you know, Dr. Eyring for establishing a, a, a fantastic tradition of, of research excellence here in, in the Western United States. Um, so after graduating, um, Dr. Eyring went to um, work for General Electric, where he had always wanted to work since he, he, he had uh, idolized Thomas Edison as, as a, you know, young boy growing up and said, I want to, to work for this guy's company, which was General Electric. Um, in 1954, um, Tracy Hall became essentially world famous at, uh, for the, the inventing uh, process of diamond synthesis at General Electric. Um, shortly after that, he left there because he had the opportunity to become uh, director of research at, at BYU. Um, and shortly after this, he was the one who proposed that, hey, synthetic carbonato might be a really, really interesting engineering material. What if we could make that in the lab? Um, so uh, he had proposed that at a conference and, and, and he wasn't seeing the idea getting a lot of traction and, and you know, uh, he thought, well, maybe I ought to just start up a company and, and try to make this myself. So in, in 1966, he founded a company now known as Mega Diamond, which makes polycrystalline, uh, makes polycrystalline diamond. Uh, 1970s, when he published uh, the, the first um, paper on centered polycrystalline diamond. So this was the, this was the genesis of the, the polycrystalline diamond industry. Today, uh, it's manufactured by you know, at least 25 uh, companies worldwide, three of those here in Utah, so Mega Diamond, US Synthetic, and Precorp. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a multi-billion uh, US dollar uh, material. Um, so just a little bit about how, how this material is used. Um, so this is, and, and, and what it looks like. So this is um, what the microstructure of a, a, a modern, um, modern, uh, modern synthesis of a polycrystalline diamond looks like. So we use diamond um, and we, we use some type of a, a metallic phase, typically cobalt or a cobalt alloy. 
And we'll talk about why, why we use a co co uh, cobalt alloy uh, as we go through some, some of the specifics, the technical things on diamond sintering. Um, but with this, we make a, a variety of different products with, with this polycrystalline diamond. Um, so to, tools for rock drilling um, are uh, probably about, we estimate about half of this market. The other half of is, is for cutting tools. Um, so anytime that, that we need to make a, a hole in the ground, um, we need to take advantage of, of the extreme uh, hardness and elastic mod modulus and thermal conductivity of, of diamond. Um, so whether it's oil and gas drilling, uh, geothermal drilling or mining, um, all of these are, uh, uh, you know, it's essential to, to have a, a, a wear resistant and durable material that can do, make these processes economically. Um, so um, geothermal, we'll mention this. Uh, we've been doing some, some really good work with uh, the Utah Forge group uh, that is, is focusing on enhanced geothermal well systems here within the state of Utah. Uh, they have a, a test well site down in the Milford area and they've been making extremely rapid progress on lowering the cost of, of producing a geothermal well. And a big part of that is the use of, of uh, highly durable uh, diamond, diamond products to, to, to drill the wells. Um, uh, mining is also a, a, a big market for us. Um, and one of the things that, that you know, we always have to keep in mind, in, in, even in the transition to a greener, um, a greener future, um, there are uh, extractive processes that are required to, to realize that future. Um, I was just, uh, I was just uh, listening, in fact, this, this morning on my way into work and talking about um, to make to make the, the the next generation of of electric vehicles, and said so the you know each each vehicle is going to take um, uh, essentially around like 160 pounds of copper to to make the vehicle, and so the the projections are to to realize a green future, you have to produce you know in the next you know 15 to 20 years the the same amount of copper that has been produced up to this point in the history of the world. That's, that's a lot of mining. And what you have to realize too, is that the easy locations are gone. You know, that um, I, I visited one of our uh, facilities, one of our customers in, in Australia um, a couple years back. And um, yeah, the, 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 their, main, their main product is, is copper. And just the extensive nature of the, the uh, extractive um, geology that has to be going on. I mean, literally hundreds of miles it drilled in extremely hard abrasive rock. Um, you know, I was, I was a, a kilometer underground. And, um, you know, to, to, to get to where the, 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 drilling, the drilling and blasting activity was going on. And, um, so, and driving back to the surface, I said, well, okay, this will take about, take about an hour. And we went to go down in an ele elevator, and you know, even that takes quite a, quite a bit of time. But driving up to the surface at a fairly good speed, you know, was you know, about an hour driving about 20 miles per hour. So um, it's pretty extensive what is going on kind of behind the scenes with, with, with some of this. And it, and it requires uh, diamond tools. Um, some of the other things that, that uh, where diamond is used, uh, aerospace, in particular in machining carbon fiber. Uh, carbon fiber is, is uh, extremely difficult to, to machine with conventional tool, tools, you know, carbide or ceramics or, or coated, uh, combinations, coated combinations of those. Um, diamond works extremely well, and um, we've been involved in projects with, with major you know, aerospace companies, in particular Boeing, and their subsidiary Spirit to, to make tools that can, can machine carbon fiber. Um, uh, another thing is, is uh, machining uh, the, the highly abrasive liners that are used in engines, silicon aluminum alloys. 
Um, Um, so we'll talk a little now about uh, some of the specifics of diamond sintering. Um, so diamond is estimated of having a, a, a melting point of about uh, 4,200 Kelvin. Um, so applying some of these, these uh, rules of thumb, um, half of that melting temperature is about 2,100 Kelvin. Um, now, if you look at where we're manufacturing diamond today, uh, significantly less, seven, about 1,720 degrees Kelvin. Um, the, the, the initial synthesis done by, by Tracy Hall was actually right on this line, uh, right at that uh, uh, half of the melting temperature. So just confirmation of that rule of thumb that you have in, in sintering of materials, self-sintering of materials. So how can we cheat the system and be able to, to, to lower the, 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 the sintering conditions? Um, well, basically that goes back into um, Kind of, kind of the, the issues that, that Mega Diamond had in its early days. So in trying to center at these higher pressures, if you look at the phase diagram, you see that slant. That also means you have to be applying higher pressures. The combination of higher pressures and temperatures leads to um, tungsten carbide cobalt anvil failures. That is the, the material that is applying the pressure. Those are quite expensive and um, so there had to be some kind of an, uh, a more economical solution for manufacturing that had been worked out. So, and, and this led to the emergence of, of liquid phase sintering as, as an alternative. So, um, yeah, so, so as, as we are going to temperatures of below half the melting point, if, if we are looking just at self-sintering material, the atomic mobility is too low. There's insufficient um, self-diffusion. So how does liquid phase um, you know, help us specifically? Um, so this is where we introduce the idea of a, of a solvent catalyst. Um, so you know, see people see that and they think, that's an odd word. Or, you know, okay, what is a solvent catalyst? Okay, so a solvent just uh, is a conventional, okay, it's something that dissolves something else in, in a liquid. Um, there's some, some fairly good solvent catalysts that are out there um, available, cobalt, nickel, and iron. Um, these all form nice liquid solid eutectics. Um, the liquid metals uh, will promote or will dissolve the carbon and promote the, the diamond to diamond bonding that we'll talk about in more detail. So if you look at the, the, the details of this, and you, know, you, see, you see that we have um, this nice little window of material where you are in the diamond stable region, and then you also have a, a, liquid, uh, a liquid material. Um, so the cobalt and nickel, so the main reason that these are used, number one, you have high carbon solubility, um, very similar uh, eutectic behaviors, um, and importantly, they're not strong carbide formers. You know? So if you're dissolving um, carbon into this, this liquid, uh, uh, this liquid metal, you don't want it to be, you want it to be available to precipitate as diamond. Um, that's the problem with iron, is you, is you are dissolving this, you, you, you know, will, a large percentage of what you're dissolving will, will precipitate as, as iron carbide, Fe3C. Um, so we'll talk a little about uh, diamond grain to grain contact. So, you know, we're in, in this, uh, sintering process, so uh, to be into the, the, the pressures and temperatures where a diamond are stable, you inevitably have to be applying pressure to a mass of, a mass of particles. So, you know, how can we look at this? Um, so, one, one fairly simple way of, of, of taking a look at what is happening at a particle basis, um, just going back to uh, Hertzian contact equations. So, um, so where, where you are um, essentially having, and spherical surfaces are, you know, um, not the most realistic, but they give a good picture of what is, what is going on um, from, from a, a, a pressure perspective. Um, so if we look at this, if we are applying a pressure of, uh, of, of say, six and a half gigapascals, say, a, 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 a typical sintering pressure that might be used in, in, in our processing. Um, 
And you look at what is happening at the, the, uh, as a first order estimate of the contact within, between particles, you see some enormous pressures developing. Um, this falls just, just basically out of the, the Hertzian contact equations. Um, so you can see that, that with, with applying six and a half gigapascals, we're over 160 gigapascals of, of pressure in between the particles. Um, so this, this has some, uh, some consequences. Um, some of the grains will fail. Um, if you look at you know, what, what is happening to that distribution, though, as grains are, grains are failing, you're, you're essentially distributing the, the same pressures over you know, the, uh, the, uh, a different number of particles. But the, the, the stresses work out to be, be quite similar. Um, so this is pretty enormous uh, um, amount of, of pressure. And it has some implications as, as you look at the, the, the centering process. So there's a couple of different pressure extremes that are um, important to consider. So one um, is the location, this location A, so directly between the particles. So we just mentioned is very, very high, very high pressure, maybe 100, 160 gigapascals. Um, the other extreme is areas in between the particles where you don't have any contact. This is empty pore space within the material. And so if you look at the sintering process, these go through a very different route. So, um, in, in our processes, we apply pressure first, and then, and then we increase temperature. So you know, essentially, this, this, this stays constant. There is some, some softening behavior as, as we get above 800 degrees C. There's some plastic deformation that goes on. Um, elastic modulus will also decrease with temperature. But as a first, first order estimate, it's, it's not too bad. Um, but in, the, in, this, in this region where you have um, no contact, basically the driving force for graphite formation becomes much, much higher because you're in the graphite stable region, you become more thermally active, you start to form you know, pocket's of graphite in this, in this pore space. It's, it's important as, as you center that these are dissolved and reprecipitate as, as, as diamond. Um, So a couple, of, a couple of additional things. Um, if you look at the, um, the solubility of, of carbon in liquid cobalt versus um, you know, the, the solubility of, of diamond or the solubility of graphite and you know, uh, extending that, uh, those, those lines as we do when we're looking at situations like supersaturation, um, you can see that there's a very clear uh, driving force for solution and reprecipitation re of and, and this is, you know, whether or not we're, we're, we're dissolving the, the graphite materials or whether we're dissolving the, uh, uh, the, the diamond off the surface itself. The, the carbon more, more easily um, uh, dissolves into the, into the graphite. Um, we'll talk a little bit now about some of the, some of the kinetics. Um, so this is, this is one of the relations that has been developed you know, for basically the mass transport relation looking at, say, um, how quickly, um, say, this diamond is, is dissolved and re-precipitated in, into these neck regions. Um, and you know, this is a more realistic picture of what is going on. You may have more point contacts in between your diamond grains. Um, you know, liquid metal, some of these pockets of, of graphite, but they, they will dissolve and re-precipitate and, and form these necks. So this is a, this is a prediction of what, what is this, this uh, neck size uh, versus time um, based on the, this mass transport um, and kinetics equation. Um, and, and essentially, um, the, the other thing, yeah, to, to, to keep in mind is, yeah, you, you have some initial contact areas that are, um, um, that are, that are weighing into this, this equation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, without getting into all the, the details of, of the derivation, because we want to get on to some other things, but, um, you know, essentially this is, this is derived, again, from a mass mass transport relation, so important things, diffusivity, uh, the solubility, 
um, the, this uh, AC, this initial contact area, um, as, as well as some of these well-known uh, kinetic terms, Boltzmann's constant, temperature, um, grain size is another thing that enters in. But what, what, um, what this initial contact area uh, AC allows you to do is, is, is make an estimate as to what is, what is the effect of pressure in this, in this liquid sintering. Um, so um, if you take the, the, the bare bones equation, it's essentially derived with, with zero GPA. If you look at, say, what is replacing this with the Hertzian relation that we showed, showed earlier, you can see that, that, that uh, neck formation kinetics are increasing by about a factor of three by, by, the, uh, by the application of, of pressure. Um, so at this point, you might say, we'll call you, well, this is nice. What, what you know, um, you know, you, as, as a student, I might have said, so what, right? You know, what, what, what does this, what does this you know, help us do? Um, so actually, so uh, getting back to some of the things that, that um, you know, we studied back in, in, in graduate school, uh, you know, how do you toughen a, a, a material? Um, and that, that basically directly goes back into some of this, this neck formation. Um, so I'm showing a couple of applications here. I'm going over, you know, some details kind of fast here, but... Um, when you have a couple of different mechanisms by which you, you might be drilling, wanting to drill holes in, in, uh, in, in rock. So one is, is what is called a shear bit. Basically, you have a rotating bit here, and you have drilling teeth that are essentially just, just rotating and contacting the rock. Um, another application is, is what is known as a percussion bit. So this is where you have um, some uh, bit with this type of a design. Instead of having cylindrical cutters, you have dome-shaped cutters. Um, and in, in this, you will have a device that is, that is applying a large amount of, of percussion that is sending a shock wave down the shaft of, 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 the, of the bit and any connecting pipes that you, or, or um, rods that you might have. Um, but so here, here's where some of this diamond, diamond neck formation becomes, becomes important. Um, in, in a material where you're trying to optimize the wear resistance of the material, you want to have uh, essentially as large of diamond necks as possible, as strong of connections in between the grains. Um, you want to have a lower metal content. Um, this inevitably involves higher pressure processing. Um, so in a material like this, uh, we have a fracture toughness, measured fracture toughness of about 7.5 MPa root meters. Com contrast this with a percussion bit. Um, so here are the, the main failure mechanisms that we're looking at is rather than wear, we're looking at diamond breakage. So you, you have to be have, making a material that is resistant to all this, this shock and vibration. Um, so here you are wanting to have small diamond necks. Um, higher metal content, lower pressure processing. So we have about double the fracture toughness here with this, with this material. Um, and you can see you know, that, that there's the, the grain sizes are, are on the same order. Um, so most of this, this, this toughening is, is coming from the fact that you have or are changing the fracture mode of, of the material, basically a more tortuous crack path here. Um, Versus versus the the, um, the the more densely bonded material. Um, so this is uh, we'll start making making a break here uh, towards the uh, second half of the presentation. We call this a spectroscopy interlude, and this this gets back to again some some of the work that I did working with uh, Professor Shetty many years ago. Um, so we use spectroscopy um, quite commonly in, in, our, um, in our business and the, the development at Megadiamond. You know, we actually have two Raman spectrometers, one uh, a, a microprobe system and another that is a, a, a larger scale fiber optics based system. Um, but the, the, the basis uh, for our, our spectroscopy work is mainly this. It's a very effective way of, of probing the residual stresses in these centered materials. Um, it, it's important as, as, as you are uh, making polycrystalline diamond um, and um, that, that you, can, you can be, because of the pressures, extreme pressures and temperatures and centering conditions, it, it, you can make 
uh, materials and components which essentially self-destruct. Um, and we want to be able to avoid those types of materials. The main, main uh, um, problem that we see with that is, is the, pro the residual stresses might be so high that, that, that we are fracturing the, the particles during, during the process. They're not able to survive. Um, so, so being able to, to look at the, the spectroscopy and knowing, uh, characterizing what the, the stresses in our materials are, are, are quite important. Um, so we used a tool, and this was initially developed um, um, by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology in the early 70s, but working out all the, all the physics of, of, of basically, diamond, and it was in support of some, some early diamond anvil cell work, where, where they were using the, the diamond anvil cell itself as the, the, the stress, the, the the material that is reply, uh, providing the signal, telling what the, the, the stresses are, those, those techniques have, have, have moved on. Um, but the, the technology is still very useful for, for us. And, and we use this, this relation in studying other ceramic systems. Um, but essentially what you have is, is you, um, if you look at the, 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 the spectrum, that you collect a Raman spectrum of, of, of a diamond, center diamond material, um, you have a pretty nice Gaussian peak. And from this, you can, you can fit uh, very nice you know, curves, uh, determine, the, determine the peak center, um, all the other parameters as well. Um, but it's from this peak center, relative to a unstressed position, that you can characterize the, the residual stress in the material. What, what we get out of this is, is uh, a scalar term. Um, with Raman spectroscopy, we're not able to, to um, uncouple this, this tensor uh, relationship um, and the, the individual stress components, but the, the, the hydrostatic stress is still a, a, a valuable piece of information. So, so we do this fairly routinely, and we've done it for many, many years. Um, but in the course of, uh, of developing materials, trying to get, uh, for example, better bonding, more wear-resistant materials, we start employing some techniques that, that will, um, you know, higher pressures, higher temperatures, for example. Um, and we notice something interesting, that as we are applying higher and higher temperatures, um, that this, this, this background is, is going higher and higher. And at first we view this as, this is, this is just a nuisance. All of, our, all of our computer routines that we have that are set up to, uh, to do, do these iterative fitting, um, they weren't working anymore. We had to go back and, and you know, reconfigure all of, all of that so that we could get the convergence we needed. Um, and, and in some ways, it was uh, another type of a nuisance. Um, but as we started looking into this, with like, what fundamentally might be going on? Why, in, in fact, um, early people during, doing this were, were just saying, no, the diamond peak is getting smaller without you know, kind of looking at what was going on, on, on with the intensity. So as we, we started looking into uh, uh, what is going on with this, this background, um, you know, we, we saw that, that luminescent diamond by itself um, is, is becoming an interesting thing in, within biology. Um, and the, the reason for this was, was the, these, these different luminescent properties um, were, were becoming important because diamond was doing something that other materials were ha would have difficulty doing. Um, so number one, uh, photostability. It means that it, it luminesces um, at essentially a constant rate without decaying. You don't, you don't get this with a lot of organic dyes, for example. Uh, they might be bright, but they might be only bright for a couple of seconds, and then, and, and then you, know, you don't have um, you know, the, the utility of that, of that uh, fluorescent center is gone. Um, so low toxicity. Um, diamond is, is very compatible with, with cellular, um, cellular structures, um, being that it is, uh, is carbon, the, the body isn't recognizing it this is, as a foreign element and isn't um, you know, creating an army of antibodies to attack it, that type of thing. Um, related to that, the biocompatibility, it, it's not, not causing problems with cellular functions. 
Um, another thing that's, that's very interesting is the, the surfaces of diamonds are a, are a veritable playground for, um, for chemists. I mean, with, with the dangling carbon bond, you know, there are all kinds of things that you can, you can attach and, and, and make, the, make the diamond, um, you know, be biocompatible with, with one type of cell, um, repelling to another type of cell. Um, Stoke shift. So this is an, an interesting, um, that you don't always have, say, with, with organic dyes for, uh, in, in particular. So, you know, having a large separation between your, your, your incident radiation and then where, where the, the, uh, the fluorescence is occurring. Many times with fluorescence, that, that is very close. And, and this, this makes, uh, this enables some, some um, ma makes the instrumentation, you know, easier in, in, in the, the imaging. Um, but probably the most interesting thing that, is, that has been emerging um, is what's known as quantum sensing. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on this just, just briefly. We won't have a, a lot of time to go into the details. And um, there are um, many more uh, experts in, uh, <laughs> that are working in this, even attending in, in, in the, the conference here today. So, or the, 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 the lecture here. So, um, but, but you know, this enables things like measurement at, uh, on a cellular level of things like temperature, electromagnetic fields, um, and then uh, more detailed things like what is the pH, what is the chemical potential, for example, with the, within, within cells. This is very exciting for um, a next generation of biological researchers. Um, so, so we we saw that we have this motivation. Okay, we, we have this background fluorescence. This 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 is this is changing as as we are um, modifying the the sintering processes that we're using. Um, so um, we we had a a, a nice uh, project that we did um, involving uh, the nanofab nanofab lab, um, also Dr. Shetty's group. So uh, Andrew Stewart, I think, was the guy working. If I'm recalling right, working. So we had a senior project, and we were looking at some of the properties of of materials that we had processed with higher pressures and higher temperatures. Um, and as part of the work that that was done, um, the Nanofab group, so Brian Van, Van Devener, um, assisting with this, uh, took some nice TEM images. And you know, as as we looked at these later, it was very clear that what we were doing were Making vacancies in in the diamond material, and you know that that's it's not unusual for materials that are plastically deformed, and you have slip planes of materials that are that are you know compressed and sliding and intersecting, They're, you know, to be creating this type of thing. But it's one thing to read about it in a book; it's another thing to see it in in real life. Um, so, so we looking at this and said, there's there's possibility that we are. Uh, creating vacancies, and this, this opens up the possibility for uh, creating nitrogen vacancy centers. Um, the reason for this is the diamond material that we work with has diamond impurities at a level of about 120 parts per million. Um, so from that, you, you know, hey, it's just a matter of time that you, you know, that if, if, there, if there is uh, diffusive processes going on, that you might be able to get a nitrogen center and a vacancy to join up and form, form a nitrogen vacancy center. So we have the key building blocks. Um, so interestingly, um, as we start doing literature review and saying, well, what, what can we learn from, from people that have, have done similar work? Um, so yeah, first of all, I mean, hundreds of papers on nitrogen vacancy diamond have been published since, since 2010 when, when this quantum sensing started coming, you know. Um, all of these that we were seeing are focusing on either uh, uh, chemical vapor deposition. So this is you know, the, the method of, of making these, these nitrogen vacancy centers or irradiation manufacturing. Um, we did come across a, a, a paper that seems to have been essentially overlooked in the literature. This is, this is one uh, going back for, to 1984. Um, and so this was uh, uh, looking at fluorescence in sintered diamond 
materials. So the same thing that we, we are uh, you know, doing our uh, making most of our uh, the uh, our engineering efforts, the, the the sintering of diamond that we talked about earlier, these people had had done this this nice this nice study, and if you look at the results, you know, they they clearly had measured uh, uh, a nitrogen vacancy uh, luminescence, and in fact they had identified this um, as a, an NV diamond, um, you, you know, color center in, in the work. So um, again, it was good indication that we were on to we were on we were on the right path. Um, so a little bit about uh, fluorescent diamond um, nitrogen vacancies. Um, so there are a few different color centers. Um, so so if we're looking at uh, um, the 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 structure here, so this is a, a diamond lattice, uh, basically uh, you know FCC uh, rock salt type of structure. Um, but with, with one missing, um, missing or, um, atom creating the vacancy, and right next to it is a, a nitrogen atom creating the NV pair. Um, green material, um, with this you have a, a, an additional um, nitrogen that is, that is joining, that joining the center. Um, and then uh, blue, this is uh, three nitrogens all combining with, with the vacancy. Um, so this, the, um, this, is, this is information that, that, that was known, and people that have studied luminescence in, in diamond in, for, for different reasons it had worked out these, um, these structures and these relations before. Um, but we saw that, that by, by using different pressure and temperature conditions, yes, we could, we could make all three different Different color centers. These are uh, uh, fluorescent microscope images with our with our materials. Um, so yeah, the the um, what 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 we knew by this time is the process. Okay, it in introduces vacancies. The the diamond powders contain nitrogen, and that by a pri uh, applying temperatures uh, progressively increasing, we can get different different diamond centers. Um, so down here, I'll, this, this is, these are the specific conditions that, that we are using to create the, the, the different diamond centers. Um, so as you, as, you might, as you might expect, just thinking about it for a little while, um, you know, if you're creating a, a, a nitrogen vacancy, a single nitrogen, that would happen at the lowest temperature. Um, two nitrogens, such as with, you have with the green, is gonna be a little, you know, gonna, gonna require a little higher thermal activity. So that's happening at, at you know around 2,000 degrees centigrade, and then the highest, the, the most difficult to form is the the, uh, the the blue center, which has three nitrogen vacancies, um, or th three nitrogens in a vacancy. Um, so another thing that 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 um, that, that we saw and, and and is important is is that we need to be for a sensing application. It needs to not just be nitrogen and vacancy, but it also has to be negatively charged. Um, and, and so, yeah, we, that was one of the early things, the signatures that we were looking at. You know, you have uh, a couple of different uh, luminescent centers, so zero phonon lines corresponding to an NV0, um, uh, the neutrally charged center, and then um, the negatively charged center. And we saw, we saw both of those. Um, and and through, through the work that we, we have done, um, you know, taking into account the charge balance that you have to be maintaining, you know, we have found ways to to increase the the nitrogen, uh, the the negatively charged amount of material, um, and decreasing the amount of 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 the neutrally charged. Um, so the other thing to point out on this is is comparison of of, of the different different ways of making different different ways of making nano diamond. So conventional process involves high energy irradiation. Um, so basically we're starting with, with similar material, basically similar nitrogen content, about that 120 ppm. Um, they're, they're general, uh, conventional process is generally starting with, with larger micron sized materials. This is irradiated with, with high energy particles that, that, are, that are creating the vacancies in the material. Um, then this material has to be um, subsequently annealed 
such that you're, you're getting the diffusion of a vacancy in nitrogen center, making that, that marriage. Um, then um, subsequently, that has to be milled and uh, powder processed in order to get nanodiamond. Quite an extensive process. People that we know that, that are working, working with this, this irradiator, radiation process is, is can be on the order of it's like two weeks. So you, all this time you're, you're renting time in a, in a, in a uh, facility that, that has the capability of, of these very high energy um, uh, charged particles. And you know, that, that is a, um, a quite, quite an extensive you know, undertaking, you know, both financially and, and from um, you know, a logistics point of view. Um, comparatively, um, you know, as we look at this, and it, yeah, and the other, yeah, the other thing is all of these key processes that are creating the nitrogen vacancy centers are, are done in the uh, graphite stable region, um, which are creating additional, additional problems that have to be overcome. So um, what, what we have... Of, have been working on is this, this process of, of making the color centers entirely within the diamond stable region um, sufficient. We don't have to do the irradiation. We don't have to do the milling. Um, we, we have found it's tunable so, so that we can um, it, you know, have the desired uh, negatively charged centers. It's also a highly scalable process that, that um, can, be, can be taken to industry uh, Levels that would be required, you know, as as this approaches a commercialization rather than a research uh, future. Um, so yeah, just just uh, real real uh, briefly here, if you're looking at the, the the contact mechanics and what what is what is involved here, um, actually some so a lot of similarities what we, to what we saw before. The, the main thing that we are trying to avoid here is now we are trying to inhibit the sintering process. You know, we don't want these particles joined together. We want to be able to break these apart and, and preserve the nanodiamond structure. So a material that works quite well for us is, is uh, just common table salt, sodium chloride. Um, and yeah, basically it's a, a similar type of, type of path in between the particles. We have uh, very high contact stresses. Um, it's this, this region that, that we believe where we're creating the, 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 nitrogen, um, the nitrogen vacancy centers um, in this highly deformed region. Um, so um, just a, a couple of things um, on going towards the application. So why, why, is, why is this uh, important? Why are people writing hundreds of papers um, on, on this effect? Um, so a lot of things co come back to, and, and you know, on the on the sensing side, um, to 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 really use this material as as a sensor, you ha you have to be employing some things other than just the the luminescence of the particles. Lots of things are, are lots of particles are luminescent. Um, you know, will will glow under laser light. Um, but to, the 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 unique thing about the, the diamond is it has this, this ability to be manipulated in, in, a, in a quantum state. Um, so this, the apparatus for this is quite, is quite simple. Um, so basically you just need a green laser um, and a, a, a microwave. Um, so you know, what is this doing? You know, if we look at the energy level effect, so, so the laser is, is manipulating things in between a ground state and an excited state. So you know, raising raising the, the electron energy, which is then decaying. And as it decays, it is uh, producing the characteristic red emission. Um, well, the microwave allows something else. That, um, that, so we, with the microwave, so if we look, look at this ground state energy, we can be manipulating the, the spin of the material. So basically, by, by using... Um, uh, a frequency of, of 2.87 gigahertz. We can we can uh, change that from ground set from a, a zero state spin to either to the plus or minus. Which you know in um, when there's no magnetic field present, those those are the same uh, um, same level. Um, 
And, and what, is, what is interesting to people looking at this is you have a quantum state that is optically readable. Um, because as, as you go to this, uh, go from a zero state spin to the plus or minus, you activate this non-radiative path. So you're now uh, with, with something in the plus or minus one state, you can raise it up and um, uh, about half of the electrons will decay through, through this non-radiative path. And what this, what this uh, allows you to do, um, if you're simultaneously measuring a microwave, you, you know, things under these conditions, so a green laser and sweeping with a microwave field, is you'll see a characteristic drop in this, this intensity, basically corresponding to this, this, this non-radiative path. Um, so some of the exciting things about this, so yes, you have, you have a, a quantum state, and this is, this is uh, some, the ODMR effect that we measured with our material um, and compared that with, with uh, commercial material that's, that's on the market today and seeing a very similar, similar behavior. Um, so yeah, the, the optically detectable um, quantum state that's operable at room temperature um, without having to, to cool things to uh, liquid nitrogen uh, or, or, or even lower, uh, liquid heliums in some cases. Um, there's also things with sen from a sensing point of view, as, as you apply a magnetic field, these, um, these spin states will separate uh, by a precise amount, making this a very, very accurate magnetometer. Um, another thing is, as uh, temperatures are applied um, using this as a temperature sensor, so you'll see this shift left or right. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll just, just sum up here with um, um, kind of going back over uh, the main point. So, yeah, um, Tracy Hall, Mega Diamond produced some, uh, uh, pioneered uh, the synthesis of polycrystalline diamond. Um, you know, we and others in the industry employ a liquid phase and pressure-assisted sintering in order to sinter our products. Um, the, the use of, of, of Raman spectroscopy has led to um, our exploration into fluorescent nanodiamond. Um, um, so this has been produced at Mega Diamonds being uh, uh, employed by uh, multiple collaborators, um, including a couple here at the university. Appreciate the uh, graduate students of Ming Lee coming and uh, um, Christoph as well. So, um, anyway, that's that's what I have. So, uh, thank you. Let's take some questions. Hey, Andrew. We don't do any doping. In fact, if anything, we would like to reduce that a little bit because, yeah, the, 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 we have more, we have nitrogen in, in excess, which causes, you know, we believe some problems with the, as we're looking at things like, uh, for example, coherence time and things like this. People say if you have too much nitrogen in there, then you, you are, are not optimizing the material. So. Yeah, so, so, the, so there's, there's, there's a few things that, that ha have been looked at. So, um, you know, so tracers is, is, is one type of application. Um, related to that, people have also looked at drug delivery. So, for example, with, with the surface that you can, you know, a highly function, uh, functionable surface that you have on diamond, you can attack, attach pretty much any, you know, drug at a molecular, molecular level that you would want. So that's another area that people looked at. But you don't necessarily, for, for drug delivery, you don't necessarily need the luminescence. You know, you can use, you know, uh, uh, um, so, so yeah, the, the, uh, the, the tracers, and, and, and so one of the things that, that people have looked at, I, um, um, 
didn't have yeah time to go through, but but was um, you know people people are are looking at this actively for for disease detection. So one one of the with the optically detected magnetic resonance, you can you can um, a group of researchers um, a few years ago showed that you could you could um, you could detect concentrations down to about 10 to the minus 18 molar, which you know that's that's pretty small concentration, and you know could be useful in 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 trying to to look at, for example, types of cancers that that are difficult to detect, and you might be able to do, to look at something detect levels of a, um, yeah uh, you know a, a particular protein or or some other indication of the disease at an early stage. Yeah. And one quick follow-up, even though it is compatible because it's just carbon, do you know if it like physically, like just having those particles in there causes a skin problem or not really sensitive to skin cancer? Um, so there have been quite a few studies done on, um, if you look at the, um, um, the biocompatibility. Um, so we're, at this point, we're kind of relying on them. You know, we, we do have some, some work that looks very encouraging. We can't, you know, disclose, but yeah, but yeah. But, but it, it, it seems to bear, bear out those, yeah, um, th those previous findings that, yeah. Huh? Yeah. Um, yeah. There, there's there's a few different few different directions. So so the the, the sensing. So so pe people, um, you know, if, if if you if you look and say, okay, with the the tools that that uh, say a biologist has at their disposal, if 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 there was um, the ability to you know to to look at, for example, I'll, I'll just pick on cell temperature. So, so a lot of studies are looking at, say, metabolism. And when you're looking at, at that at a cellular level, yeah, what, what might be going on with temperature within a particular cell, particularly a, maybe a disease cell, you know, you would expect to see something interesting going on. And, and if you could precisely measure the temperature within the cell, it, it would be quite valuable. So, so th that's just one indication. I mean, there are, there are people, um, and, and maybe this gets to I, one of the questions about the, the, the biocompatibility. So there was, there was a really interesting study where nanodiamond was, was put into uh, uh, live worms. And they were looking at basically uh, what, is, what is happening, what type of signals are being sent as, as, the, as the, the worm is, is moving. Um, and, you know, because this, this is uh, uh, an effective... Um, electromagnetic sim uh, uh, sensor, they were able to to basically look at that 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 the electrical and magnetic response um, as as the the worm was moving. Quite quite an interesting study. So there are a lot of things that that I think it will enable in the field of biology that that you know haven't been um, accessible just because the tool hasn't been there. Uh-huh. Cobalt catalyst and excess magnetic is that you're doing the sintering, so we're shrinking up any pores that are left in our carbon. How are you separating the cobalt out from this nano powder? So yeah, so um, so one of the things with the nano powder, we're not using cobalt. So that's that's one of the big big departures. Um, we don't want the material to sinter. We want it to be very, very you know, we call friable. Basically, we want that that mass to be essentially break apart, and so that, that's why we'll, we we are using salt rather than than cobalt as 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 an additive during during the high pressure, high temperature process. And that was the nitrogen center formation. Yes. As, as the original process. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm hmm. We, we haven't seen that. We've, we've had 
you know, diamond samples that we've had for months that, you know, we, we pull, pull and, you know, measure periodically and, okay, we haven't, we haven't had them under illumination for months, but, you know, it's, it seems to be um, quite photostable. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. So, so fun to hear. Exactly. Yeah. This is the this is the best group we've had.